the Lord ever bless. It's a joy to be with you again. Uh, you remember when we were with you a month ago, we asked the question, what is biblical prophecy? And we uh, saw that there was an answer in the scripture. In Revelation 21, it says that the witness of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So that which points to the Lord Jesus is the very breath, the very life of the prophetic message. It's the core of the, the heart of the prophetic message. And we're noticing that and the prophetic message has to do with telling forth. And so the scriptures tell forth the Lord Jesus. They proclaim him. They display him. They talk about him. They reveal him. This is the center of God's interest, his son, the Lord Jesus. It should be the center of our interest. And it should be the center of our understanding of the word of God. And we're noticing then that in the, uh, in the law, the prophets, and the psalms, the writings, through the... All of these speak of Christ. They witness to Christ. And we're noticing that they particularly witness to the Lord Jesus with regard to him as the suffering Savior and all the sacrifices. We see the bloodshed and we see the suffering of the Lord Jesus, suffering and death of the coming Savior. And then we also see the, the prophecy, the telling forth and the foretelling of the coming King who is going to reign and this coming kingdom is going to be glorious and forever. Last step, uh, uh, time we're with you on Lord's Day. We were looking at prophecy in the New Testament. Uh, how do we get back to that right? That's right. Yeah, there we are. Prophecy in the New Testament. And we're noticing that in the Gospels we have the uh, Lord Jesus presented again as a king who will be rejected. You remember in Matthew 21 in these verses, the parable here, uh, 33 to 46, the, the king has a vineyard, he seeks fruit from his vineyard, he sends servants representing the prophets of the Old Testament times, and they killed them and they maltreated them, and then he sent more and they did the same to them. And finally he said, I will send my son, surely they will reverence him. But the son was rejected, and the nation will be punished. That was the message there. Uh, then in the, the Olivet Discord, Matthew 24, at 25, we see those three questions. When shall these things be? When, what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the age? And the Lord Jesus answers those, I believe, in reverse. And he tells in the first uh, part of uh, Matthew 24, of the uh, first half of the tribulation period, the seven seal judgments and the seven trumpet judgments. And then when we come to the second half of uh, we got the, here's some, We have the Great Tribulation, verses 15 to 31. Uh, we have the uh, the Great Tribulation, the second half of the seven years, three and a half years. Ahead of myself here, saying, uh, and in that he deals with the seven vile judgments, as I see it in the Book of Revelation. So in the first half of the tribulation, first three and a half years, remember, we're noticing that there will be wars and rumors of wars, there will be famines, there will be pestilences, there will be persecution, and so on. And these all correspond with the seven seal judgments and uh, Revelation chapter 6 and the seven uh, uh, trumpet judgments in Revelation basically chapter 8 and one of the, in chapter 11. And uh, these have to do with the, the great tribulation. And let me emphasize again, just before we go on here, that Jesus sets the marker for the beginning of the great tribulation. He says, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, then know that this is the beginning of the great tribulation. Then shall be tribulation such as there never has been before, in this world and there never will be a game. And of course the precursor of that, remember, was uh, the uh, event where Antiochus Epiphanes uh, actually uh, conquered Jerusalem, 168 BC, and he actually caused the, uh, the mothers uh, to stop uh, circumcising their children. He slew a pig on the altar of Jehovah and he set up uh, an image of the king of the, the the false gods of uh, Zeus uh, Olympus, and uh, he caused people to worship him. So that's going to happen again, as Paul says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 
the Antichrist is going, the man of sin is going to set himself up in the temple of God, proclaiming he is God and demanding worship as God. So we see uh, in the Gospels quite a bit, uh, all through the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, these parables that indicate uh, the fact that the Lord Jesus is the suffering Savior, but he is going to be the reigning king. There is one rather interesting point that I didn't point out last time, and I think you should notice. Uh, we do not get too deeply into the Gospel of John, but uh, there is an indication in the Gospel of John of the rapture. Did you ever notice that? When the, the uh, see my brother agreed with me there, I'm glad of that. Remember at the uh, tomb of Lazarus, at the raising of Lazarus from the dead, when uh, Mary and Martha came to greet him, you remember, he said, if you'd been here, our brother had not died. He said, well, you know your brother will live again. And he said, yes, we know in the day of resurrection, he will, he will, the last day, in the judgment day, he will, he will be raised from the dead. But Jesus said, listen, he said, he that liveth and believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. See, in the game, let me illustrate with my father and mother, about 35 years ago, they died the nine months of each other, 1972 and 1973, they went to be with the Lord. So they lived and they died and they will live again in the resurrection. But Jesus said, he that liveth and liveth in me shall never die. And I expect to be one of those. I believe Dr. Whitton is going to be one of those too. You know, because I think the Lord is coming very soon. You see, and if the rapture takes place before we die, we will never die. We will never see death. So there's, there's some rather interesting indications in the Gospels of uh, future events and of the, the uh, second coming of the Lord. Now, uh, we also went on to uh, look at uh, Paul's epistle. And remember, I made a, tried to make a strong point the last time uh, that uh, I was with you, that the replacement theory, the replacement theory, this is the theory that the church has replaced Israel, the God will never use Israel again, is wrong. And that pointing out this view is held by the vast majority of the mainline, quotation mark, ch Christian churches, Catholics, the, the uh, Lutherans, the Reformed churches, the Anglican, the Presbyterian United Church, so on. They believe that God is never going to use Israel as a uh, witness for him again that that uh, has ceased and that the church has replaced, that's where you get the word replacement, has replaced Israel and God is going to fulfill all his promises and covenants with Israel through the church and of course we could show you ways in which the scripture shows that that is not possible and uh, the point here is that this section of Romans, where Paul deals with the nation of Israel, chapters 9, 10, and 11, he points out specifically that God is going to use Israel again. He says in chapter uh, 9, verses 10 and 11, where he deals largely with the past of Israel, he says, a, a remnant shall be saved. In chapter 10, he says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, both Jew and Gentile shall be saved. And then when we come to chapter 11, he says, God hath not cast away his people. See, the replacement theory says he has. He'll never use them again. He has not cast away his people, which are for you. Have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. And then he says, when the, if the, the, the turning away of Israel for a time has caused life to come to the Gentiles, how much more their fullness, when Israel is brought back, and their fullness is realized, why it shall be life from the dead, like life from the dead. What shall be the receiving of them be but life from the dead? And he says, God is able to graft them in again. Blindness in part is happening to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in, that is until the rapture. And let me emphasize again, because you need to realize these differences, the, we all need to, that the fullness of the Gentiles is not the times of the Gentiles. The fullness of the Gentiles will be accomplished at the rapture. That will be the fullness of the Gentiles, the end of the church age. But the 
the times of the Gentiles will go on for another seven years till the end of the tribulation period. But we will come to the end of the times of the Gentiles, the end of the domination of Israel by the Gentile world empire. And then all Israel shall be saved. So the replacement theory has to be wrong. Now when we, we were looking last time a little the end at 1st Thessalonians chapter 4, where we have the rapture. And we remember, we were noticing there that uh, at the rapture, we have only the church involved. Only the church. Paul speaks, speaks about those who are sleeping in Jesus. Those who are dead in Christ. The dead in Christ. And that term is a term that is only used in the scripture of the church, those who are in Christ. The church is the body of Christ, we were noticing. So we are in Christ. Actually, more accurately, in the Greek, we're in the Christ. The Christ is the head plus the body. And the church is his body, Paul says, over and over again. The church, which is his body. You and I are the body of Christ. The church is the body of Christ. And we're noticing there that the rapture only has to do with the church. The Old Testament saints are not raptured, and uh, the, the saints of the tribulation period are not raptured. This church, which is his body, those who are in Christ, who are in Jesus, they are raptured. The dead in Christ will rise from the dead first, and then we which are alive and remain will be caught up together, not separately, not there rising, rapt being raptured first, and then we being raptured, but they, are rot they rise from the dead first, then we're caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. One body, not part of the body, the partial rapture is not correct, that only part of the body is going to meet the Lord in the air. Not part of the bride is going to meet the bridegroom in the air. Not just some of us are going to be raptured, the spiritual ones, and not the carnal ones. We're all going to be raptured because we have all been baptized in one spirit, into the body, one body, the body of Christ. So that's important to understand. And this is the day of Christ. We are going a little bit into that last time. The day of Christ, all six times, and it is specifically mentioned by that name specifically in the church epistles, has to do with the church. The uh, day of Christ does not have to do with Israel. And it does not have to do with the pre-Israel saints or the, the, the tribulation saints. It has to do with the church, the day of Christ. It has to do with the judgment seat of Christ, the bema. And we all as part of the church are going to uh, be judged for our service, not for our sins. We'll never be judged for our sins, thank God. My sins were judged at Calvary. And so Jesus said, I will never come into condemnation, never come into judgment. Doesn't mean I won't come into judgment for my service, valuation for my service, but I will never be judged for my sins. That's gone. That's, that's finished. That judgment was born at Calvary. And then we're noticing last, the end of the last service, I think, 2 Thessalonians, where Paul says that the day of the Lord is coming. It hadn't arrived then, though well, some people were writing letters and signing them with Paul's name and saying that, that the day of the Lord had already arrived. No, the day of the Lord had not arrived because when the day of the Lord arrives, there will be a tremendous apostasy first, he says, and then the man of sin, the Antichrist person, will be revealed. And he is the person who will set himself up in the temple of God, claiming that he is God and demanding worship as God. So I think that's about where we got to last time. Uh, now, I'd like to look a little bit at Peter's epistles, especially 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 to 14. Now here, we have a tremendous scripture. I often used to speak on this and use it when I was uh, associated with the Creation Science Association of Ontario, which is now, which then became uh, Answers in Genesis, and is now Creation Ministries International. And, uh, Rather interesting, because there Peter describes by the Spirit of God, the inspiration of the Spirit of God, he describes exactly what evolution is, what the doctrine, the teaching of evolution is. He says there will come mockers in the last day, 
mockers making a mockery and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For all things continue as they were since the fathers fell asleep. And uh, they, they say, in other words, things have always been the same. And you probably know that this is a, one of the very basic elements of the theory of evolution, you see. Where do they get this idea that the Grand Canyon took millions and millions and millions of years to build up, that these layers took ages, ages to accumulate. They deposited the sedimentary rocks, they built up over thousands and millions and millions and millions of years. And all these life forms, these fossils, which are found in the layers of the rocks, of course, they, they existed over millions and millions and millions and millions of years in, in different evolutionary uh, uh, gradations and forms in the geological uh, column, as it's called, which is a fantasy, of course, because it's up and down and backwards all over the world. As you probably know, some of the most primitive forms of life are on the mountaintops all over the world. Fish forms, basic, basic marine forms of life are on the, the mountain ranges all over the world. The Himalayas, the Andes, the Rockies, wherever you go. The geological column of Darwin and evolution, of course, and you have simple marine forms of life and so on at the bottom, and gradually more and more complex forms as you go up in the various strata, the layers of Earth. Absolutely, evidence shows absolutely the opposite. And it proves what the Bible says. It's an evidence. What the Bible says that the, there was a universal flood, not a local flood, a universal flood, and the waters covered the highest mountains, 15 cubits above the highest mountains. Now, I personally believe that the highest mountains then were about 5,000 feet high. I think there's pretty logical evidence for that. But you see, the whole earth was covered with water, and how did these marine, primitive marine forms of life get to the highest tops of the highest mountains? By the Noahic flood. Perfect explanation. But Peter points out here, he says, people will come and they will mock, and they say, everything built up very gradually. All things continue uniformly. So you, you've got gradations of rock, millions, and millions and millions of years. That's how we see uh, sedimentary rocks form now. It takes a long time for little bits of soil to build up and build up and build up and build up. You see? That makes sense. But it doesn't make sense if there was a worldwide cataclysm, a worldwide flood, and the very foundations of the earth erupted and the fountains of the great deep opened up. See, the rain that came down only came down for 40 days. That wouldn't have covered the earth cover the mountains for 15 cubits, but the, certainly the eruption of the, the, the fountains of the great deep would, would supply that water, you see, and then the formation of the vast ocean canyons. In fact, you know, the, the largest ocean or the largest uh, mountain range in the world is under the Atlantic Ocean, basically, wraps practically around the earth, mainly in, in the bed of the Atlantic Ocean. But you see, the, the, Peter says here, they're coming mocking and they're saying, all things have just been the same. Everything's always been the same. God never moved in with cataclysm and flooded the earth. Rather interesting, the word in Greek there for the waters overflowing is cataclysmos. God cataclysmed the earth. And of course, some knowledgeable theologists today are admitting that there has to have been periods, there have to be periods of great cataclysm in the history of the earth. But the other interesting thing that they claim is that there was no flood. He says they are willingly ignorant of this, the, water, the earth standing in the water and out of the water was cataclysmed with water, was overflowed with water. But that the, the other thing they refuse to believe is that God has shown, and we're going to see this in the Old Testament, hopefully soon, God has shown that it, the next time that he is going to destroy the earth, it's not going to be with water, it's going to be with fire. And the heavens will pass away with a, with a, a roaring noise. And the, the elements will be melted in the fervent fire. And the earth and the works that are there will be burned up. And then, perhaps we should turn to it to get the exact wording here. 2 Peter chapter 3. 
Notice some of the things he says. There's some very significant word. There's some very significant word here. The word of God is so exact and so precise. Every word of God is God breathed. We need to understand that. So he said in Second Peter chapter three, if you look at uh, verse ten. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10, he says, But the day of the Lord, see, now we're talking not about the day of Christ, the rapture of the church, but we're talking about the day of the Lord, the day of Jehovah, Yom Yahweh, Yom Yahweh, the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord, this has to do with Israel and the nations. And the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. We're noticing the rapture isn't going to come to the church as a thief. We're looking forward to it. It's our prayer. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. It's our blessed hope. But for the world, the unbeliever, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Surprise them. Take them as a woman in travel. And in, in, in which, in the day of the Lord. Now notice this. It's going to be in the day of the Lord that this is going to happen. Peter says, in which day the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements, the basic structure of the universe will melt with fervent heat and the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Now notice this. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation, in all holy conduct of life? And godliness. Now get this next part. Looking for, we should be looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God. Now this is a different day. The day of the Lord is different from the day of Christ, but the day of God is different from the day of the Lord. Now if you take my King James Version of the Bible here and the translation this would, that would be contradicted partially, you see? Because it says in the next line here, in the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Now we have just read in the previous couple of verses that the heavens are going to pass away with a great noise and the elements are going to melt with a fervent heat and they earth and the works that are in are going to burn with fire in the day of the Lord. Not the day of God. And here, if you translate this word, actually two words in Greek, diahain, if you translate it wherein, it would say that the heavens and the earth are going to be burnt with fire in the day of God. And I tell you, this puzzled me for a long time. And, uh, then I realized, I'm not an expert in Greek, but in a little bit, a little bit, and uh, studied in high school and university and in seminaries and so on, and taught it a little bit. And uh, this, this word that they, these two words in Greek, a uh, preposition and a pronoun, uh, they translate wherein, really means with a view to, for the purpose of, that is in preparation for the day of God. See, so when the day of God comes, that's the eternal day. That's the eternal day. New heavens and new earth. But the day of the Lord, clearly, from the previous verses, and by according to this verse, when it's correctly, correctly understood, in preparation for the day of God, the heavens and the earth are going to be burnt with fire. They're going to be purged with fire. See, there we have the parameters, and this is what I'd like to get across tonight, Lord willing, the boundaries of the day of the Lord. Try to get this clear, and I think it will help us, and I think we'll be seeing this in, in uh, following uh, messages. The day of Christ has to do with the church and the church alone, those who are in Christ, the body of Christ. The day of Christ occurs at the rapture, having to do with the church alone. The day of the Lord now, notice the boundaries that have been set by Paul and by Peter here, 
for the day of the Lord. When does it begin? In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it begins with an apostasy, the great apostasy. We're commenting on that last year. And the world is turning away from God. That's what an apostasy is. Apostasy is. And it will begin with the revelation of the man of sin, the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist person. So it clearly takes in the tribulation period. Well, we notice this particularly when we look at the book of Revelation. The day of the Lord, the day of Jehovah, the day of Yahweh, takes in the tribulation period. And it also has to take in the millennium, the thousand year reign of Christ, because we will be noticing shortly, and you're probably aware of this quite well, that it's at the end of the millennium that Satan is loosed. He and his armies attack the saints of God in the holy city, and fire comes down from God out of heaven and destroys them. That's when the heavens and the earth are purged with fire. So the day of the Lord takes in the tribulation period, seven-year period, tribulation period, and the thousand-year period millennial period, the reign of Christ. And it also takes in the purging of the heavens and the earth with fire. That's the day of the Lord. And the day of God, as we will see, is the day that begins with the eternal day. New heavens and new earth. We're in well with righteousness. It's rather interesting that Paul uses that expression here. He says, uh, in verse 13 of 2 Peter chapter 3, he says, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth. See, the, in the day of the Lord, the old heavens and the old earth have been burned up. And we have a new heaven and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. It's rather interesting to notice that during the millennial period, that righteousness will reign. People, both believers and unbelievers, will be forced to obey the Lord. The Lord will reign over the earth, and he will reign in righteousness, and righteousness will reign, as the Old Testament prophets prophesied. But when we come to the new heavens and new earth, then righteousness dwells. You don't have sin. You don't have rebellion. You have righteousness dwelling. It permeates the new heavens and the new earth. There's no sin there. Nothing that maketh an abomination, nothing hateful to God, nothing that, that maketh a lie. No sin in the new heavens and the new earth. It's a great divorce. Spoke of it, okay? All right. So, the day of the Lord, according to 2 Peter 3, 1, 14, the heavens and the earth are burned with fire at the end of the day of the Lord in preparation for, not wherein, but in preparation for, decaying. Actually, in Greek, Verse 12, the day of God, the eternal day. Preparation for the eternal day for the millennium. So there we have the boundaries. Now, I would like tonight to get on a little bit uh, to the Revelation. We had a very brief line of it before, but I'd like to look at it in a little more detail in preparation for going back to the Old Testament and looking at the day of the Lord in the Old Testament and the day of God in the Old Testament. Rather interesting. That the day of Christ really is not mentioned in the Old Testament. It's pictured, but it's not mentioned. Because, of course, the Lord Jesus wasn't born. He wasn't given his name, Jesus. Thou shalt call his name Jesus. That's a New Testament term, right? The angel said that to uh, John the Baptist, didn't he? Or to, to, John, or to, to Joseph, the mother of Jesus. He said, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Jesus means... Jehovah's Savior, salvation, Jehovah's salvation. So, we don't have the day of Christ in the Old Testament, but we do have the day of the Lord, a great deal, as we will be seeing. And it's rather thrilling, amazing to me, really. When I began to re realize this in, in first reading of the Bible as a young Christian, uh, to see how often, almost every page of the prophets, Isaiah right through Malachi, we have the day of the Lord, 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 the day of Jehovah, that day, that great day, over and over and over again. And it describes exactly what we'd be talking about from the New Testament with regard to the day of the Lord. And then it's going to be a, a day of terrible wrath. 
and judgment. God is going to judge the world for its evil. He's going to judge all the world for its sin. It's going to be a day of judgment, a day of horror and darkness and wrath and judgment and a sword and of tribulation and pestilence and famine. But it's also going to be a glorious day. A day of prosperity and peace and joy and eternal gladness. So how do you put these together? Well, we just see this in the New Testament. And we'll be seeing this, Lord willing, in the Old Testament. So I wanted to lay a bit of more foundation for this uh, by looking just a little bit further at the book of Revelation. Here we have the witness of Jesus. That which points to Jesus is the spirit, the very breath, the very life of prophecy. And what do we find in this wonderful revelation of God to the Apostle John? Probably written about 95 AD. Probably was about that, that old too. He's probably about 95 years old. And it was written, as you know, on the Isle of Patmos. And it was taken from Ephesus to Patmos and imprisoned there, probably had to work in the mines there. He was at a great age and maltreated and that God gave him this great revelation before he was released and returned and lived and died in Ephesus. Joan and I had the privilege about three years ago of visiting both Ephesus and Patmos on a journey a trip called the uh, In the Steps of the Apostle Paul. So uh, here we have this revelation that God gave John Marvelous revelation. And Christ is the center of it all. The witness to Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And in chapter 1, we see Christ in the center. I love that. He is seen in the center of the churches, of the seven churches of Asia, the seven candlesticks. And he holds the seven stars, who are the angels or the messengers to the seven churches in his right hand. But he stands in glory and in dignity and majesty as the great high priest and the judge in the midst of the seven churches, I mean, seven assemblies of Asia. And that's chapter one. That is what you have seen. You've seen Jesus standing in the midst of the churches, the high priest and the judge. And you can tell that from the clothing and description of our Savior there in chapter one. Chapters two and three, we have the letters to the seven churches. And it's amazing, uh, actually, in a little uh, uh, prayer breakfast that we have every Thursday morning in the restaurant in Bradford, our town. We're dealing with that right now. This little prayer, meeting, prayer breakfast has been going on for about 30 years in Bradford. We pray for our town. We've seen some wonderful things happen there. I wish I had time to tell you about some of them. One of the things was that the previous marriage uh, was converted while we were praying for him. Frank Jump, and he quite a mayor, and uh, he uh, was a, a Roman Catholic. His wife was a Christian, though she went to the Roman Catholic Church. She was a born and gay woman, but she went with her husband. And uh, Frank Jumpman, the mayor of Bradford, was saved gloriously. We were praying, and then he did a marvelous work for a group called Cross Traders. Maybe you've heard of them. Uh, Jody Greenstreet and Patty LaRose, that's our spark plugs of this, they used to be in our assembly at River Drive, and the Lord has used them in marvelous ways, almost in some ways like George Mueller, a work by faith amongst the young people, many in our town. Those are some of the things that have happened. But anyway, it was led for years by a chap who wanted to become a Baptist clergyman, so he gave up his business and he became a Baptist pastor, and uh, he's uh, Pastor now right near Halliburton at Eagle Lake. And when he became too busy to lead the little devotion each morning, he said, Harold, would you mind leading us? So I've uh, tried to do that for about 10 or 12 years. And we went, we've gone all through the Paul's epistles and writings of the Hebrews, uh, James and epistles of John and Peter. And, and now we're starting Revelation. So we're on this very section here now in our prayer breakfast. And it's been amazing as I looked again at the seven churches of Asia. And those seven churches, I know they were literally seven churches at the time. And the angels or the messengers or the pastors or elders 
that were sent with these messages were sent with those specific messages to those seven churches. And I know that all of the seven churches have continued to exist in some form in all the church age in the last 2,000 years. And there have been the, all the seven church types of churches around for 2,000 years. There's the big church at Ephesus, and there's been the church at Smyrna, and there's been the church at Pergamos, and there's been the church at Thyatira, and there's been the church at... Uh, uh, Sardis, and there's been the church of Philadelphia, and there's been the church of Laodicea. But, in a most fantastic way, it's thrilling to me that they also represent the whole church age. The church at Ephesus, the first, first church that is mentioned, describes exactly the apostolic church, the church of the first century or so. And it was a church that was sound in doctrine, and was sound in practice and laboring for the Lord. And one drawback, they had left their first love, you remember. The second church, the church of Smyrna, uh, by the way, Ephesus means pleasant, basically. And the church of Smyrna means suffering. This was a suffering church. This was a persecuted church. And it existed from the first century to the beginning of the fourth century, till Emperor Constantine's time. And he says, you will have 10 days of tribulation. And it's interesting, in that period of 200 years or so, there were 10 distinct periods of terrible persecution by the Roman emperors of the Christian church. And then things changed at the end of that age, when the Edict of Milan was passed, and before, just before the Edict of Toleration by the uh, Emperor, the, 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 the persecution ceased. You remember, and, and virtually everybody in the Christian world said, ah, how wonderful, how wonderful. Now Christianity is a favored religion. But you see, it wasn't in all ways a good thing because when the Christians were persecuted, they were real and they suffered for the Lord and their testimony was true. But when it became a, a, a favored thing, a politically correct thing to be a Christian, then why? What do you get? Suddenly you get that political Christians, nominal Christians. And we read of the Church of Pergamos, which means thoroughly married. The word gamos, you know, in Greek it means wife or woman, just as uh, isha in uh, Hebrew means um, uh, wife or woman, same word. The, the, Husband of one wife, husband of one woman, the man of one woman, the man of one wife. It's exactly the same, they're exactly the same words in Greek and in Hebrew, you see. And so the church becomes married, thoroughly married to the state. And, wow. What do you get? You get corruption. And you get wealth coming into the church. Big cathedrals and choirs in Rome instead of little groups of uh, faithful Christians suffering persecution, meeting in homes. Now we get a situation where it's wonderful, it's advantageous to be a Christian. And uh, that's Pergamos. And we see that up until about the 8th century. And then we get Thyatira which means the incense ascend, ascending of the Dark Ages, the Dark Ages, marked by the influence of Jezebel, the, the evil woman. And the woman becomes dominant in the, in the, the nominal Christian church, the Roman Catholic church. Mary, Mary all the tree. You see, worship the virgin. Very interesting this. All through history, Satan is always counterfeited God's works, right from the beginning of time, right from the very beginning of Genesis when God said, the seed of the woman shall bruise the serpent's head and the serpent will bruise his heel. Death blow the serpent suffering for the seed of the woman. He has tried to imitate and to uh, counteract purposes of God. And you've got the big Virgin Mother, right back in Genesis 10. Nimrod, the, one of the chief 
instruments of Satan in the early days of Scripture, the founder of Assyria and the, and the heathen uh, world empires that always opposed Israel and opposed God. Nimrod had a wife named Samaribus. And she had a, a little baby boy called Tablas, who was supposed to be virgin born. And you got the big virgin mother mentioned in Ezekiel, the, or sorry, in Jeremiah, that's queen of heaven. Isn't that interesting? You know, Catholic churches sometimes are called the queen of heaven. There's one right near where we used to live in Richmond called the queen of the world, Mary queen of the world. And, and, and you know, it, it's rather interesting that uh, the, 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 there's the idea of virgin-born child there. The little babe and the big virgin mother. And, and uh, Tammuz is mentioned in Ezekiel. They were worshipping Tammuz in the very temple of God in Ezekiel's time. And then you get in Egypt, Isis, big virgin mother, and Osiris, little, little virgin-born boy. And then you get which is also Ashtaroth, the, the Queen of Heaven, and, and from which you get Esther and so on. Anyway, and Ishtar. And then, at, at, and then you come to the next empire, the Grecian Empire, and what do you get there? You get uh, Venus, and, and uh, no, you get Aphrodite, rather, and you get Eros, which we get the English word erotic, uh, f physical love, and so on. And then, when you come to the Roman Empire, you've got Venus, and you've got Cupid. And what have you got today? You've got Mary, and you've got the little Christ child. Everything's reversed, you see, but there's a limitation there. Virgin born, child, worship of the woman. And in, in Thyatira, the big thing was, was Jezebel, that, that heathen queen who, who was the, the Satan's channel. And uh, you've got that all through history. And that comes to the fore in the Dark Ages, the Church of Thyatira, from about 800 to 1517, when Martin Luther nailed the 95 Theses on Halloween night to the castle church door at Wittenberg. And uh, you, you've got this idea, too, that begins quite early in the Roman Church. In fact, St. Augustine uh, said one time, to be saved, you not only have to have Father God, but you have to have Mother Church, Mother Church. You know, it's, it's absolutely blasphemous, you know. The Pope by Papal Declaration, Ex Cathedra, actually proclaimed that Mary was born sinless and that she was assumed to heaven in a sinless state and uh, that she is a mediatrix between man and God. It's blasphemy. Because the Bible says there is one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus, not the woman Mary. So there you have Thyatira. And then, of course, you come to Sardis, escape. And with Martin Luther, 1517, we get that. Justification by faith is preached instead of faith plus works, as the Catholic Church still officially proclaims. And there was a great escape. And many, for, for a time, had life through this. But then the Bible says, you have a name to live, but you're dead. And you look take the average Protestant church today, and they're as dead or deader, deader than, than Roman Catholics. The average mainline Protestant church today is so dead that they even deny the basic truths that the Catholics believe that the Catholics still believe in, in the deity of the Lord Jesus. They believe in the Trinity, in spite of what they've added on with Mary Altry and so on. Uh, they believe in sin. They believe in judgment for sin, even though they've added on works and penance and so on. So you've got the Cyrus escape, and then you've got the Philadelphia Church. I haven't time to go into that. But the Philadelphia Church, starting in the late 1600s, early 1700s, saw an explosion of, of, of brotherly it's a church of brotherly love. The putting down of all this hierarchy, the de-emphasis of popes and cardinals and archbishops and bishops and archdeacons and deacons and all that kind of stuff. And the realization that we're all brothers in Christ and the mission work and the evangelization of the world took place in that period with the Moravians and with the Wesleys and with the Finneys and the Edwards and the Spurgeons and even leading on from that the Billy Graham, which I had time to go into that. But anyway, 
Then finally we've got the church, which is, we largely see in the world today, lay the sea of their heart, which is lukewarm. So we've got that. We've got the letters to the churches representing the seven church periods. Then when we come to chapters four and five, we have John Rapture. A door is opened in heaven, and a voice, like the voice of a great trumpet, says, Come up! Together, and John, that we represent the church, is caught up into heaven, into the very throne room of heaven. And he sees, amongst other things there, you remember, the seven seal scroll. And it contains the rights of universal judgment and dominion. Amazing. The seven seal scroll. Wow. And uh, you remember, nobody's found worthy to take this scroll first in heaven, earth, or hell. And then one is found, and he is seen as the Lion of Judah, the conquering king. And he's also seen as the newly slain little lamb, the Arneon, not the big lamb, but the little gentle lamb, freshly slain. And in that seven seal scroll, we have the seven seal judgments. And that's in chapter six, actually, the seven uh, seal judgment doesn't come up until a couple of chapters later. And it's rather interesting. I used to be very puzzled at this, you know, because it says at the uh, end of the uh, uh, introduction of the seventh trumpet that this is the very end. But yet there's seven vile judgments, seven bowls of wrath of God still to come. And think, how can this add up? But you see, you should get this picture in your mind. The seventh seal contains the seven trumpets. And the seventh trumpet contains the seven vials. So when you've got the seventh trumpet, you've got all of the seven vials right there. It's something like a Roman candle, you know. It goes up, and four or five or six or seven, we say, uh, fireballs come out of it. And then out of one of those comes seven more. And out of the last one of those comes seven more. And that's the way it is with the uh, judgments. You have seven sealed judgments. Then you have the seven trumpet judgments. And we're almost finished. Chapters 11 to 15, I am convinced, and I hope you will be convinced too by the time we finish, that we have now the beginning of the week, the middle of the week. And what do we have? We have preparations for the Great Tribulation. The seven seal judgments, I believe, are past. I don't believe for a minute that the, the judgments are cyclical, or cyclical, as some say, that they're all occurring at one time in different fashions. Many great teachers teach that, but it can't be true because, you see, uh, the seven vials, the last seven judgments, are much more severe and much more comprehensive than the seven trumpets. So they have to be consecutive. They're not concurrent, they're consecutive. They follow one after another. The book of Revelation, I believe, is chronological. So you've got preparations here for the Great Tribulation for the last three and a half years. Notice what happened, beginning chapter 11, the temple is preserved. Measure the temple, but don't measure the court of the city. I believe that the Mosque of Omar, the Golden Dome Temple, and the Temple of Jehovah are going to exist on the Temple Mount together in the last three and a half years. We'll be talking about that later, Lord. Okay? You've got the two witnesses for the last three and a half years that can't be killed until God allows it, that bring these tremendous miracles to witness to the Lord Jesus. You've got Satan's angels cast down to the earth. You've got global power given to the beast. Remember that seven-headed beast we saw in about a month or so ago, representing the seven world empires that have oppressed and uh, enslaved Israel? So you have global power given to that beast, supported by the false prophet, the third person in the trinity of evil. You've got a trinity of evil here. You've got the dragon, Satan, then you've got the beast, the human being, and then uh, who is the physical, fleshly incarnation of the spiritual power, just as Jesus is the fleshly, bodily incarnation of, the, of his Father. And then you have a third person, the false prophet, third in the Trinity of evil, who supports the beast and gives glory to the beast and causes all men to worship the beast, exactly as in the Trinity of righteousness, the Holy Spirit fulfills the same function of causing everyone to 
be pointed to the Lord Jesus. And in those chapters, you have the evangelization of many Jews and Gentiles. In the second mention of the 144,000, which the Joel Witnesses like to talk about so much, I believe you have them now martyred, and they are before the throne of God, and the sea of glass, and they represent many, many Jews who have been evangelized. And then we are also presented with those who are, are, are converted through the 144,000 of those that they represent through the Jews. Uh, these are the people that are martyred for the blood of Jesus. It stood for his blood, for his testimony, the testimony of Jesus. Here we have again the spirit of prophecy the is the witness of Jesus. Chapter 16, we have the seven vile or bold judgments. And these are the judgments of the last three and a half years. And they end with the battle of Armageddon and the leveling of the whole earth. The sixth uh, vial of the wrath of God is the, is the judgment of Armageddon. When not only the kings of the east, Japan and China, no doubt, and Indonesia and India and so on, gather against uh, Jerusalem to Armageddon, to Har Megiddo, the Mount Megiddo, the Valley of Jezreel, but the whole earth. Every nation on earth will come against Jerusalem, will come against Israel. Chapter 17 to 19, you have God's judgment of Babylon, the ongoing satanic world system, religious, political, and economic. We have the destruction of the beast and his armies at the return of Christ to earth. The beast and the false prophet are cast into the lake of fire, not Satan. Satan is chained for a thousand years in the bottomless pit in the abyss, chapter 20. The saints reign with Christ for a thousand years. At the end of a thousand years, Satan is loosed and gathers an army against the saints. Fire comes down from heaven and destroys Satan and his armies, and he is cast into the lake of fire. The great white throne judgment takes place. All unbelievers are cast into the lake of fire. And then when we come to the last two chapters, we have the new Jerusalem descending, should be from God out of heaven, and there are new heavens and new earth. So, Jesus is not only the suffering Savior, but he's the reigning king. There will be new heavens and new earth where he will reign forever. And we shall be forever with him. Isn't that wonderful? We read the last chapter about the winning side. Okay, so next uh, time, Lord willing, we want to look at the day of the Lord in the Old Testament, from Isaiah through the Old Testament prophets. And I think you'll find it very interesting. I mean, you need to get a grasp of these things. The day of Christ has to do with us, the church, those who are in Christ. The church which is his body. The day of the Lord starts with the tribulation and goes right through the millennium, right through the burning with fire of the heavens and the earth. And then the day of God, in preparation for which the heavens and the earth are burned up, and the great white throne takes place, the day of God. New heavens and new earth. We're going to dwell with righteousness, and we're going to dwell with the of God forever and ever. So let's pray. Father, we just praise you. Thank you for your wonderful revelation of your purposes. Not only your vast love for us in giving the Lord Jesus to be the suffering Savior, but Lord, your wonderful revelation of the fact that he indeed is the worthy one who will forever be the reigning king. And we have gladly bowed the knee to him in time. And Lord, what a wonderful joy it is to know him as our king, and Lord, our savior, our friend. Lord, we just praise you. And Lord, we thank thee that we're looking forward very soon to that time when we will be with him, we will be like him, and we will reign with him forever and forever. Now see to bless thy word, bless thy people. Remember those that aren't well, remember those that are going through trial, Persecuted saints, Lord, we ask you to bless particularly the assemblies of thy saints, and especially the ones, Lord, that are meeting according to New Testament principles in a simple way to seek to obey the Lord and to reach out to the lost. Lord, we just praise you, give thee our thanks now, and ask thy blessing in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Man, Patrick, you weren't so, being so funny when you said you go on to 9 o'clock. I didn't think I'd do that long. <laughs> Thank you very, very much for your attention.